you're from Newfoundland. Yeah. And as Canadians, we're really proud that you're one of our own. But my understanding is that it wasn't actually until you moved to the United States that you dedicated your life to Christ. Right. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah. Um, and it was really simple. I mean, when I was 20, my parents got separated and I moved with my mom to the States. Mm. I wasn't even really a, a practicing Christian at the time. You know, I'd been raised sort of in this kind of traditional Irish Catholic kind of life, you know, and it was a cultural thing. And I always knew that God was real. I always knew that he existed. I never questioned him. I never questioned that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Savior, that he died for my sins. I just didn't get how much he actually really loved me mm. and how much he cared about every detail of my life. And I think a lot of times what can happen is because of scandal or because of the brokenness of the human condition, I know that where I grew up, a lot of people put their faith in other human beings. Mm. It's like, well, I'm going to put my faith in a man because he's a priest or he has a collar around his neck or I'm going to put my faith in my pastor because he stands up every week and preaches the word of God. And, and it's like you're setting yourself up for failure because mm. really we're supposed to put our faith in the authority of Christ and learn how to love as Christ loved us, which is unconditionally. And God accepts us mistakes and all, and so he calls us to learn to extend that mercy to others. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it took me leaving an island off the coast of the Atlantic Ocean and off the coast of Canada and moving to the desert <laughs> to learn that. And um, that's what happened. I started going to church, and the day after I showed up, it was the 4th of July, and I figured I was going to like one of those tailgate parties or something. I'm like, I'm in Arizona. It's right next to Texas. They're probably going to shoot fireworks and shoot guns or something. I have no idea. And I was like, what are we doing? She's like, we're going to church. I was like, we're really? And I was like, well, I can't kill me. So I sure, why not? <laughs> and I think that's one of the things that to me is different about Canada than the United States. As so open-ended as Canadian culture is, there's an openness to things spiritual as long as it's not Christianity. So it's like, I'll talk about anything except that. And I understand that, but it's like, for me, it was really that simple. I went to church. I got plugged into community. I met people my age who were living the faith. And I said, I want what they have. And it was sort of like, this is what's been missing from my life. And it was really that simple. You know, my conversion, it was just sort of sudden and quick and pretty easy. And one of the things I've realized yeah. is that it's not always that easy for everybody. Mm, right. And the thing I've been thinking about a lot lately in prayer is right after Jesus has been scourged, he gets brought before Pilate. And it's this really pivotal moment where he's bleeding to death because he was beaten to the point of death. And here he comes before really the representative of the world. Pontius Pilate, he's a representative of the secular government, the pagan society, the world. And standing there, beaten, bleeding to death, he has a philosophical conversation about the truth. He could have said anything. Jesus standing there could have said, if you don't worship me right now, you're going to hell. He could have said, I'm the son of the living God. You shall have no other gods before me. He could have said anything, but he chose to have a conversation about the truth. Mm. To me, I go, that's where the church is today mm. in society. In, in North America and really in Europe now, it's like believing in Jesus is like believing in Santa Claus in Europe. It's sort of like that's where the church is. It's kind of beaten to this point of almost beyond recognition in, in a secular sense. And so we stand before the world and we can choose to say whatever we want. But to me, it's like I want to follow what Jesus said and sort of re-engage in a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I realize that, that that's the best way because ultimately the thing that led to my conversion was the Spirit of God. It wasn't another human being. So I can't convince somebody that they need Christ. All I can do is just live my life and live out this relationship. And hopefully the way I do it would cause them to maybe stop and ask questions. And that's where God takes over because God changes hearts. People don't change hearts. So what church was that that you went to? Well, at that point, it was a, a church in Tempe, Arizona. It was Our Lady of Mount Carmel. It's a Catholic church, mm -hmm. and there was a youth movement that started in the States called Life Teen and the Catholic Church, and it's sort of like a Catholic version of Young Life, which is a very predominant movement uh, in the non-denominational church. And really, it's just a movement that's designed to basically reach out specifically to kids within the Catholic Church and introduce them to a relationship with Christ. There's a lot of rich heritage and tradition in the Catholic Church, but sometimes there's a complete disacknowledgement of who it's all about. Someone compared it once to 
putting royal robes and a, and a crown and all this beautiful jewelry and, and ornaments and stuff on a three-year-old. They have no idea what all this stuff is about. And really that's kind of been part of my mission and my heart is to help just reintroduce just the, the bare essential of you have a God who loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you and he wants to encounter you every day. And part of my ministry has been calling all Christians to that, you know, and mm-hmm. us remembering we have a lot more in common than, than we do um, that divides us. Now, your ministry is pretty wide in terms of the denominations that you reach out to. Yeah. How much of your time do you actually spend ministering in the Catholic Church? Um, it's sort of shifted. Three years ago, it was kind of 100% or 90% and 10%. And this year, so far as the first year that we're actually scheduled to play in more hmm. kind of neutral venues, more non-denominational stuff than before. And that's really exciting to me because, you know, I don't have an agenda. My only agenda is Jesus. But I think, you know, a lot of people do have misconceptions about the Catholic Church. And yeah. just to be able to stand alongside people here, like this weekend at Break Forth, and say, look, I'm a believer just like you, and I've been saved by grace through faith, and that's witness enough, you know? Yeah. I know that a lot of people will kind of walk away, even from like the worship session this morning, and they're kind of scratching their head going, that guy was a Catholic? What is going on? And to me, I go like, that's the gospel. Jesus came to just turn worlds upside down. He just came to just like confound the wise, you know? And so that's the God I want to serve and and be about. Right. Now, my understanding is that you got to know Rich Mullins as well. Tell us a little bit about that, what influence he had on you and, and your relationship. Yeah, um, I had been at this church in Tempe and met another worship leader who started being like a mentor figure to me. His name was Tom Booth. And Tom had just started developing a friendship with Rich. And Rich had called him and said, hey, I wrote this musical based on the life of St. Francis. It's called Canticle of the Plains. And it's Francis's life, but set in like early cowboy America. So, so yeah, it's really interesting. So Francis was Frank, you know, and he has this conversion. And so I got cast in it. It was spiritual typecasting. I I paid my way through the first three years of college by playing piano at a Radisson Hotel in St. John's. And I got cast in this musical as Frank's best friend, Ivory, who played in a saloon. And it was just the craziest thing. So I hung around all week with this guy, Rich Mullins, but I didn't even know who he was. I hadn't really heard much of his music. I'd heard Awesome God, but that was about it. And it was funny because I was like, I didn't even think it was that great of a song. And then I found out after that he really didn't even like that song that much. (laughs) And it turned out to be his most popular song. I go, that's God, you know? So it was amazing. It was really who he was as a person that really inspired me. And then hearing his songs after the fact just kind of drove it home even further. For me, it's just been the rawness of his relationship with God and the rawness of who he was is what has kind of inspired me to be that authentic, Mm -hmm. you know, and just to be that real with people. Now, of course, one of your most popular songs is uh, Your Grace is Enough. You don't have the same view of, of that as uh, Rich Mullins did about <laughs> Awesome God, do you? <laughs> no, no, not, no. I'm, I'm glad I got to be part of that song. And uh, to me, it's like you write songs, and Awesome God's a song like that. Some songs, they're just they're bigger than anything that you'll ever get to be part of. And, you know, it's just truth. You know, I just was praying one day with the scriptures unfolded on my lap, and out came this phrase. We have mountains and valleys as Christians, and we have, we have mountaintop experiences, and we could say a phrase like, your grace is enough, and we're like celebrating it, you know? And then we have times where, like Paul was in the scripture, and he's having a thorn in his side, and he's begging God, take it away, take it away. And Jesus is like, no, my grace is sufficient for you and your weakness. And really, it was from a season of doubt and kind of learning to trust in God when the feelings aren't there and when all those experiences aren't there. It's all about just commitment at that point. And you you make a statement of faith and you say to yourself, if I sing this over and over again, I know it'll ring true in my heart. 